Um, I'm Natalia Brizuela, I'm a professor of film and media in Spanish and Portuguese and the interim director of the Arts Research Center for the year. And I'm honored to be welcoming Shuda Brata Singulta. I'm sure I, I, I've been practicing that, but I'm sure I said it wrong, but that's okay. Um, as Rox, um, today for an evening that is possible thanks to two collaborations. At an institutional level, the collaboration between the Arts Research Center the UC Humanities Research Institute, the Institute for South Asia Studies, and the Departments of Art Practice in English. I want to thank all those centers and departments um, for all the work and support uh, for making this event possible and last night's event as well. Um, we had a seminar at the Van BFA. But there's another collaboration that has made the visit possible and that is the Arts of Critique collaboration that has curated most of the Arts Research Center events for the year. And that collaboration is um, one that has brought together Tarek El Haik, who's a professor of anthropology at UC Davis, Annika Lenson, who's a professor of art history here, Lee Rayford, professor of uh, African American studies here, Palomi Saha, professor of English, and myself. Um, and I especially want to thank Polomi Saha for all her work and her leadership for uh, today's events and yesterday's as well, because if it weren't for her, uh, Shuda's presence here would not be possible. Um, the Arts Research Center's year-long program around arts of critique seeks to prompt anew the question of the dialectic of art and criticism from the standpoint of social and political exigencies of our times. The presentations and conversations throughout the year address the transformative capacity of contemporary art and art criticism to inscribe in and actively condition or mobilize collective imaginaries and struggles contesting domination. The contemporary does not only refer to contemporary artistic forms and productions, but more widely to art that in its afterlifes and futurity is signified and contextualized as contemporary. The events this year explore art as a mode of political performativity and embodied critical engagement with the geopolitics of injustice, normalized anesthesia, fascism, destructive violences of displacement and occupation, as well as contemporary forms of dissent, protest, and rearticulation of democracy. None of these explorations would and programs of the year would be possible without the extraordinary work of two other people who are here in the room and that I would like to acknowledge with a big round of applause. And those are Lauren Pearson and Laurie McPhee. And now to the Rocks Media Collective. Um, Monica Narula, Jabish Bakchi, and Shuda Brata Singupta follows its self-declared imperative of kinetic contemplation to produce a trajectory that is restless in its forms and methods, yet concise with the infra-procedures that it invents. The collective makes contemporary art, edits books, curates exhibitions, and stages situations. It has collaborated with architects, computer programmers, writers, curators, and theater directors, and has also made films. It co-founded Sarai, the interdisciplinary and incubatory space at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies in Delhi in 2001, where it initiated processes that have left a deep impact on contemporary culture in India. Rox, as you all know, has had so many exhibitions, has curated so many exhibitions that if I were to name them all, I would be here all evening. But I am going to mention just the most important one, and I am from Argentina, and so that is the exhibition that they had at the Fundacion Broa in Argentina in 2015, just to name one. Um, I wanted to end my presentation with um, something that, a couple things that rocks have written about themselves. Um, so all of these are quotations um, from texts that Shuda uh, actually circulated among us uh, before his arrival. In 2014, in a text titled Questions to Self, Rox wrote, who is Rox? It's an author, a work, a crew, a conspiracy, a constellation, or a conversation. 
And the answer is rocks. It's a being with six eyes, six feet, six hands, six feet, one vagina, two paired testicles, three tongues, and half a mind to get behind queries like this to ask whether, instead of having to offer up a confession, rocks can simply be a rarely asked questions. On most days, rocks is an artist. On Sundays, rocks dust book dusts bookshelves, makes cakes, tallies football scores, dreams of unwritten novels, and ages gracefully. Who do, who, why do you make art? Following question. Because the sum total of banality and boredom still exceeds the quantum of astute and bespoke dreaming. Because the color mauve and the shape of a Joshua tree in a desert and the sadness in the face of a sloth in a zoo and the shoes of a very small child and the stench of a morgue and the slope of an argument are all still waiting to be considered in full measure. In another text from 2010, Rox described the collective and their practice in the following way. We are a collective of street people who began thinking, working, and making things together almost 20 years ago. So that would be 28 now. The conversation that transformed our collectivity into a collective is still continuing, but it began with small, modest acts of friendship and solidarity, a plugging into each other's nervous systems by passing a book from one hand to another. The simple fact of writing in each other's notebooks, watching films together, or wondering what we would do if we could work together. Disagreeing when necessary and agreeing whenever possible. And by continuing to know that agreements and disagreements did not, cancel, do not, can, did not cancel each other out in a zero-sum game, but spiraled instead to new levels of connectedness. The figure of the individuated artist and solitary intellectual, which is actually just a momentary blip in the long history of individuated practices and dialogic forms of thought may have prevented a consciousness about the space of art making as a commons from emerging in a fulsome manner. But as artists, intellectuals, and curators go about forging hitherto unimagined geometries with their peers, both within and outside the art world, the collective disposition for doing things together with others, which is in any case the normal default mode in which humanity acts, will eventually overtake the solipsistic turn that art and intellectual life took under the pressure from a generalized alienation of human beings from the ground of their sociality. As this process gathers its own momentum and as we get used to our own plenitude, we will begin to be surprised at the lonesome spiritual frugality of the life of the solitary artist and the curator alone in his or her exhibition. And I wanted to quote all that because um, the question of the collective and of the collaboration is, I think, something that is at the heart of what we're trying to do at the Arts Research Center this year, but also at the heart of what I think many of us on this campus and outside of this campus are trying to build in this moment of extreme planetary and political <coughs> crisis. So with that, I'm passing the word to Shuda, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Natalia, for that, um, for holding up that very scary mirror <laughs> <laughs> to, um, to my momentary spiritual frugality. <laughs> More used to having my comrades with me, but we'll, we'll deal summon, with it. I summoned them. You summoned them, very beautifully, thank you. The life of any artistic practice tends to be in media's res, in the middle of things within the flux and chatter of maneuvers, arguments, and stories. We could say that this is the inhalation and exhalation of practice. In classrooms, we learn how to think. I spent a wonderful afternoon in studio visits with three exceptional young artists. We learn how to make things. We could say that this means making thought that works or making work that thinks. In our understanding, these are two ways of saying the same thing. And it is this Janus-faced thought-practice relationship that lies, in our view, at the heart of both artistic work and the situation of learning and learning together in a university such as this. And we often find ourselves in conversation with such a context because we learn from it. And in this setting, teaching, lecturing, talking, learning with friends and colleagues, 
as excellent as Olumi and Natalia and all the others who are here today. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you for this opportunity to think a few things together with you and share some of our journeys. This presentation consists of a stitching together of fragments, notes, and thoughts that call out <coughs> our practice and what I would like to remind myself of, our itinerants. They're about being both multiplied and divided, dividuated, if you like. A word actually that's older <coughs> than individuated. I know that here, I know from Kathy Wallerstein that you have a Department of Rhetoric here, which is such a wonderful thing to have. I wish there were departments of rhetoric everywhere. I told her when I grew up, I wanted to be a rhetorician. But in a department of rhetoric, one would learn that words like dividuated have a history prior to being individuated. One way of thinking about the word rux, which enters our vocabulary from languages like Persian and Arabic and Urdu, is uh, to consider it as a synonym for dancing. Um, it is also to see it as the name for the revolutions described by the ecstatic movement of whirling dervishes. So, you know, that's what whirling dervishes do when they whirl. That's what turbines and engines do when they whirl. That's rocks. Each revolution, each rotation, each step of the dance, is an instance of what we like to call the kinetic contemplation of the world. Of a thought that moves a body, of a movement of the body that asks a question. It would be one thing if the task today was to describe the movement of a single point in space and time. But having chosen to be a trial, a triangulation, there remains the requirement to account for the triune velocity of the practice. And so this presentation moves a little bit here through our work, some of it, a little bit there through our notes, some of them, and a little bit everywhere through our questions. Not as in a practiced pas de deux, but instead in the manner of the ninth three-step move in chess, a slightly awkward pas de trois. Consider a triangulated image in media's res, a triptych of horizontal rectangular frames, three images, of a donkey crossing an empty road, a man standing on an empty highway with a surveying instrument covering his face, and a camera on a tripod in a sand dune in a desert accompanied by a shadow apparently left behind in a hurry by an absent photographer. The donkey, the surveying human, <clears throat> The camera and the photographer's detached shadow seem to be caught in an eternally deferred time, waiting for something to make the emptiness of the stretch they occupy meaningful. Take the solitude of the donkey. And it could be an image of a, what it means to be forever crossing the road to oneself. Take the camera and the shadow of the absent photographer. And it could be an image of understanding what it means to glimpse the shadow of the mind of a body that is not available to us because it is not our own, alone. Take the camera, and it could be just that, a disguised or an imposed figure image of what it means to survey the world, to see the world, and take its measure without necessary reference to an atomized <coughs> self. Could it be that these three pictures constitute a provisional collective self-portrait, a selfie in triangulation, and an estimate? Could it be that making is something that happens when in order to try and listen to yourself, you have to talk to others and have the world talk back to you? Conversation, internal conversation, and eternal conversation in time, traverse across bodies and minds, across the legi legibility and illegibility of personal, broken, private, or public languages, across worlds. And this is an image of a moment in the conversation between the three of us in Rux. We sit every day, nine to five, in our studio, Monday to Friday, Saturdays and Sundays, like we said, we make cake and do other things. <laughs> but in the Monday to Friday, we sit across a table with our three computers, constantly writing to each other, even when we're screaming at each other. 
So every angry denunciation of the other person's self is saying, you talk so much bullshit and you've been talking that way for 27 years, <laughs> which is a normal conversational move within the Rux Media Collective, is instantly annotated by some other consideration or thought that gets archived in the practice. We invited a friend who is a software programmer to construct a kind of snapshot of that conversation. And this is a conversation not just between the three of us, but it is also a conversation that we're having with the rest of the world. And artistic practice these days spends at least three quarters of its time filling insurance forms. And that is also a part of the conversation. We are also doing strange things on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram. That is also a part of the conversation. So there is this sense in which the soup of the conversation is the meal that we eat every day. And that's the picture. And that picture becomes a way of touching ourselves. So please do not touch the work of art, the sign that you see in every museum everywhere. We've always thought that this is where it's at, this moment of touching yourself, because you are that work in progress, in media's res. Touch do not please the work of art. Work do not please the art of touch. Touch the art of work do not please. Please work not do touch of the art. Do not touch the art of work. Please, please do work. Touch not of the art. Right? And so on. But that conversation, to return to its figures, also produces beings from its depths and its intensities. Here it produces the figure of a deep sea diver. This is from a moment in our exhibition, uh, if it's possible, it's possible. I don't know how you say it in Spanish, it was said in Spanish. Si es posible, es posible. Si es posible, es posible. Yeah. Which was uh, at, the, at Proa. You, you see? Yes. And I didn't even know this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think this particular image is from its iteration in uh, the Muac in Mexico City, Una. And um, it, one, of the, one of the possibilities open to the public was to become a deep sea diver and walk around the exhibition wearing a diver's suit. And that produces very strange things. It produces a view of the world that's, that's lateral, that is submarine, that produces a sense of the submarine horizon of consciousness, which in another text we've talked about as being the condition of contemporaneity, being submerged and yet looking for a horizon line. But this deep sea diver is a, is a companion to our practice. Like a cosmonaut is a companion to our practice. Like the neurosurgeon who enters the depths of our nerves is a companion to our practice. And they have emerged as companions as a way of being the kind of figures that we, that we invoke in some sort of complicated, I guess, everyday planchet, or you know, the thing that you do when you call spirits. And they become our interlocutors. They have things to say to us, we have things to say to them, and they enter our work. The deep sea diver has many iterations and forms, and um, constantly produces resonances of its kind. But sometimes it finds other companions for itself. Here, for instance, is a rhinoceros, who you might remember from um, Albrecht Dürer's rumor of an Indian rhinoceros called Ganda, simply Ganda, who was lost under the sea while traveling from Portugal to Rome after the rhinoceros came to India. So it was given to the Pope as a gift, got submerged in the middle of the sea, drowned. And Dürer imagined the rhinoceros only through conversation. He did a pretty good job considering that he'd never seen one, right? So this submerged rhinoceros becomes um, a companion again, and it begins entering our work this time as a figure in the gardens of the Goldenkian Museum, and now it's found its way and a home somewhere else in Yorkshire. It enters a conversation like a whim, as a possibility. It turns into an image, the image turns into a question, the question turns into a work, and then the work to return, returns to ask its questions. We could call the contours of such a conversation, which happens constantly between the three of us, the basis of our artistic actions. 
The work is a conversation. Conversation is the work. For a work, a conversation to take hold, it sometimes becomes necessary to erect a scaffolding of concepts, gestures, words, images, textures, and rough durations. Yesterday, we spent a lot of time in the seminar talking about the place of artistic research in practice. And I ended up trying to say something like this, which is that research is the scaffolding you need in order to erect the edifice of the work. And then you get rid of the scaffolding. Without the scaffolding, you cannot make the work stand. But also the research, the scaffolding should not come in the way between the work and its object. That's at least the way we think. And it then reconstitutes materials of the work. They may first appear to constitute the material of the work, the research itself, and mark the boundaries of the work. And then the material can come from many kinds of sources, a scenario, a puzzling image, an enigma in philosophy, a recalcitrant moment in history, a literary journey, an illegible object, a speculative drawing, unavailable materials, close attention to records of observations or to traces of events incidental to the making of the universe, such as the blood of stars, which I'll talk about in a moment. But let's return to um, that snapshot of the, the computer program simulation of the traffic between our three computers. And that became the basis for a drawing film, um, which is called Anybody, everybody, somebody, antibody, and it's, a converse, it's, it's the matrix of the conversation. And if you like, then this becomes a moment in the history of the Rocks Media Collective, while it is trying to do the impossibility of having that conversation with seven billion and one people of the planet Earth, because that is the desire, if not the claim. We want to be able to make art that will eventually be able to address, and eventually, in futurity, the entire population of the human race. I think that's a modest claim. <laughs> because there is no other reason as to why, you know, the people who made the traces of their hands in the caves in Lascaux, or why the people who produce Tanjore bronzes in the south of India, or the wonderful miniature paintings that we saw yesterday, they were all producing work for the complete accident of the encounters that other people would have with them. A kind of planetary encounter with everybody. It's also an understanding based on our increasing admission of the fact that individuated self doesn't just mean me and my friends in my head talking to each other but also means the millions of organisms that constitute a human body. We are a coalition of life forms. Some of those life forms get really active when we die. Others sleep and help us digest the food. So we are not just one person. We are a million and a half people usually, most of whom are very small. It helps us to move between here and the infinite. This is a moment in a performance called The Last International that we did at Performa in New York, where, uh, where one of the dancers, actors, speakers, thinkers of the performance was trying to make a move between here and everywhere. So the figure of the lemniscate, which is the figure of eight horizontally expressed, if, since some of you are from the art of English literature, would uh, it would be familiar to you from Nabokov's the evocation of the lines drawn by a boy riding a bicycle in the snow in pale fire mm -hmm. right it's the drawing of infinity and we've been really interested in the idea that infinity itself is an available construct something that is close at hand this entire process of working with infinity then begins to produce its own other fractions. Small drawings on newspaper, for instance, coated with blackboard paint. The lines themselves begin figuring in large installations, in museum spaces. They become the 
the texture of a carpet to sit on and talk to each other with. The carpet for, um, this is, uh, it's called a carpet for the three tasters. And the three figures you see in that Japanese screen are the figure of the three tasters who are Lao Tzu, Confucius, and the Buddha, who tasting a vat of wine said, one of them said it's sweet, one of them said it's, the Buddha said it's bitter, and uh, Confucius said it's sour. And between the three of us, that's a constantly changing configuration of what life is like. Um, so it becomes a, a carpet, a vehicle to sit on and think about that triangulation. It becomes a carpet to have more extended conversations. So the carpet, it's the work itself, becomes a platform for conversations. This is at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, where we curated a series of conversations on the carpet to be produced for the museum. It becomes the cladding and the interior sort of surface of, a, of mass transport. Here, um, trains in the, in the Gwangju metro in Korea, where we were um, invited to produce a work considering the uprising against the military dictatorship. And we realized that all uprising begin with conversations. And it was to those conversations that we gestured when we converted an entire train into this matrix of conversations, which would then host recitations by actors about uh, democracy and liberty based on um, the readings of what had happened there. Now the deep sea diver enters the Someone who's made a film wearing the suit in the show that, of our work. And that's what makes it really interesting for us because all the effort at reading this show was done by a member of the, an anonymous member of the public who put up something on YouTube that I found. Right? So it takes a body of questions and answers, which was part of a performance on the table called the Bureau of Frequent, Bureau of Rarely Asked Questions, which is another way of reading the word rocks, rarely asked questions, as opposed to frequently asked questions, or FAQs. <laughs> Those of us who use computers in the 20th century know what FAQs were. Right, so those questions and answers become the substance of the spoken word content of this piece, and the deep sea diver basically goes on a trip through our work, looking at, you know, clocks that spell time through emotions, looking at the work of electricity and revolutionary consciousness, looking at all sorts of other things, right? Um, and then it becomes a means to have these long walks. And I kind of think now as 
The Monty Python did the Ministry of Silly Walks, right? Rocks do other kinds of walks. We produce long installations and shows, which are excuses for people to have a bit of an amble. And this is from a, another work, um, The Blood of Stars, which we preface as a walk in ten scenes. It's inside an underground, abandoned nuclear military facility in Sweden. It's where the Swedish army would go in the case of a nuclear attack. They never have, luckily, so far. Um, but it was a work that we did where, we, where, the, where our desire was to look at what goes under the ground. Right? And one of the things we became very fascinated by, and it's our continuing study of materials, is iron and iron ore. So this is a work that took us to the largest single seam iron ore mine in the Arctic Circle, in the north of Sweden, in a town called um, Kiruna. And um, looking at iron made us think about where it comes from, and it is, as we said, the blood of stars, because iron and the earth comes from interstellar um, materials. And it means that our bodies themselves, the blood in our bodies, connects us to cosmic material. And this scatter of sleepwalking iron then reconstitutes itself as this long anvil and a film inside a cave. Other things begin to happen when you pay close attention to materials. You begin to find materials haunted by their forms and by their spirits. So, being Punjabi by nature but Bengali by disposition, <laughs> I suppose, I'm very caught and entrapped by the legacy of ghost stories, which we all grew up with in Bengal. And we, were th we constantly began investigating the ghosts of materials. So there is a whole series of work that has now begun which looks at specters. This is an abandoned railway station in somewhere in deep northern Japan, which takes, wants to lift off from the body of its, from its host, and then move into the sky, to the ghost of a boat in Bangladesh, um, in Silet, which is still in the making, we're still working on this, but this will be a, the ghost of a boat in an island, which is a ghost of an island in Silet somewhere, right? So it's, it's that kind of paying close attention to very ordinary, everyday materials and structures. A little railway yard, a boat, a, a little bit of iron somewhere in a coal mine, and trying to summon the spirits that speak through these structures. In our correspondence with a man called Toshio Kondo, the curator of the triennial where the ghost of the railway station was, we had a strange and beautiful exchange on translation, ghosts, and things. We were trying to find a name for the work, and we came up with the idea of token, like a token is a spirit of something, it stands in for something else, right? And there is a Japanese word that we found, which we thought really expressed this, and this is from that correspondence, about the Japanese translation of the title from token. As there is no Japanese that perfectly fits the English meaning, I, he, looked up many Japanese words and tried to imagine the impression which the word would remind us of. I finally decided to translate it, he said, as Utsushimi. The word itself has a bit of a literary style impression and has been used for many centuries, but can still be understood by most people. It means a double image or duplication of an image or a figure, but in a different format. It's a beautiful word, I believe. So not just materials, but even words have their ghosts and shadows. This point, where the meaning of a work crosses over from being still in preparation to the state where it finally is prepared to meet the world in a completely different context, is a moment of dilation. It's like the scaffolding falling away. The work both sheds stuff and dilates simultaneously. That's what translation is about. And it rocks between two Bengali speakers and one Punjabi speakers who use a third language of English between ourselves. We often had to say translation is our mother tongue. And with this, we thought of how do we address the divided histories that lay claim on us and that we 
share a bit of. This is a work for um, an exhibition that was uh, asked us to think about the legacy of the partition of the Indian subcontinent. And we thought that instead of constantly looking back at the past and lamenting the loss that partition entails, what if one begins to think about it as something that leaves us with possibilities for the future? The possibility, for instance, that we are actually strangers. If you meet Indians and Pakistanis or Bangladeshis, they'll all, after two whiskeys, everybody will say, oh, we're the same people. <laughs> That's bullshit. We're not even the same people in Delhi. Right? We're strangers to each other. And if we were to accept the fact that we're really strange, maybe we could begin to have a conversation. And so there are three poetic fragments about being strangers and being accept and finding being strange and being estranged an acceptable basis for a future conversation that we thought was the only way to address, for my generation, to address the legacy of partition. Three poems. The, the, the one on top is um, from Aga Shahid Ali, great American poet, also of Kashmir. And he write, this is a fragment from the poem that he dedicated to Edward Said. Uh, Will you, beloved stranger, ever witness Shahid? Shahid means both witness and martyr. Two destinies at last reconciled by exiles. So interesting that a Kashmiri exiled poet was writing to a Palestinian scholar about the possibility of reconciliation by displaced peoples. Mm -hmm. The second fragment is from Fez Ahmed Fez. Those of you who know a little bit about what's happening in India these days will know that the great and beautiful town of Faizabad, no relation to Faiz and Faiz, has been now renamed as Ayodhya. So some people have been saying on the internet we call him Ayodhya and Ayodhya. Anyway, forget that. Sorry. Faiz and Faiz. And this is a poem that he wrote at the point in 1971 when Bangladesh became a different country. It's a loved one. हम के ठहरे अजनबी इतनी मुदारातों के बाद फिर बनेंगे आशना कितनी मुलाकातों के बाद We who have become strangers after so many encounters with each other When will we embrace each other again after how many meetings? It's a, it's a poem of parting, of saying farewell A Pakistani poet saying farewell on Right? And then the final one Rabindranath, Ochena ke bhai ki amar bore, Ochena ke chine chine utpe jibon kore, which means, why should I fear a stranger? It's by getting to know the stranger that my life will be fulfilled. Some other point of the of the poem it says, Chilo amar ma Ochena, Nilo amai kore. My mother was a stranger before she took me in her arms. So there are three very beautiful ways of thinking about being strangers to each, towards each other. Not insisting on this South Asian rubbish of constant familiarity. Right? The work then becomes a work about translation because its premise is you will not probably know unlike you have this strange not very healthy childhood that I've had of having being literate in these three languages. Most people know one or two of them, right? And so you would have to take it in your hand and see that this, the letters actually begin to touch each other. They produce shadows on each other. I was talking to Gabriela, who is here today, of a work that this work then led on to, which does a similar thing between two other fraught languages, Hebrew and Arabic. It takes the work of two other bodies of poets, Yehuda Anachai and Mahmoud Darwish, and produces a conversation mediated between Hebrew and Arabic by English, by doing a very similar thing. Here, this is a token that you take in your hand. In that instance, I don't have images of that to show you here, there are large architectural structures where the words actually reflect and shadow onto each other. But here, this is called translator silence, the translator is unavailable until you find someone, a friend, who will be able to translate for you what the words are. And the poems are not translations of each other. Right? They, they are an account 
of the untranslatable which is the stranger in each one of us. And it's my belief that if as an artist I can make people, some people in my country, accept that it's all right to be a stranger, I will have gone quite far. So, this business of creating walls, having separations, having conversations with each other is a consistent pattern. This is a work, it's on your poster, I believe, this image from this work. It's called Undoing Walls, and it was in response to an invitation by us to consider build that wall, which uh, your president wanted Mexico to pay for. Not our president. Is it? Oh, it's <laughs> some of your president. I mean, he is the president of the United I mean, Modi is my prime minister. I have no way of not saying he is. People put him there. Anyway, so Undoing Walls takes the idea of the Jali screen, which is a common architectural element in South Asian architecture, which is both a wall and a screen, something that lets in light, lets in air, and also acts as a filter, as a filtering device. And it's a way of thinking about what would happen if one were to take this principle of letting the perforations overtake the structure of the wall. You go closer and closer to the wall, you see more and more of empty space and aperture rather than the built form. This is a slightly low resolution version, a trial version of this work, but, um, but I think it's quite a lot of fun. So you see things begin to blend and, and bend and crack and so on. So if, if one were to imagine the walls between nation states in these fluid forms, perhaps we could begin to talk about a different kind of translatory practice. This mode of thinking about the world that we live in and its histories is in a sense something that constantly haunts our practice and what its claims to be are. So here, for instance, another moment in time. This is a work called Coronation Park and it's so large that people don't think it's an artwork. I've known, I've known important art collectors in Delhi who went to Venice Biennale who asked me, so where is your work? And I told them, you're sitting on it. <laughs> and they said to me, no, no, this has always been here. <laughs> to which I have nothing. I mean, that's, that's wonderful. That's the, the disappearance of the artwork in the beholder, of the, in the eye of the collector is one of his is great achievement. <laughs> <laughs> but these uh, sculptures um, are from a series, a garden installation. It's a landscape architect here, Felix. So this is installation for a landscape. Um, which takes its title from a place in Delhi that I used to go to a lot as a as a univers as an undergraduate university student because it's where you could go and smoke up. It's it's a it's it's a place called Coronation Park. It used to be the site of um, where the great coronation darbar of the Prince of Wales and Queen Mary happened when they came to India in 1911 and declared Delhi to be the capital. British Empire. And um, right now it is used as a kind of strange dumping ground, a, a mass reliquary for all the statuary of the British Empire. So New Delhi uh, had lots of statues uh, of King George V, Cornwallis, Dalhousie, Curzon, all these people. And the roads were named after them. And then this is where they went to retire. So we took that form of their truncated, interrupted, eroded state to offer a meditation on the inevitable hubris of power. India is now a country where statues are being built on rather large scales. We've just built, uh, our Prime Minister has just built a $300 million worth of bad sculpture. <laughs> it's pretty, you know, that's ambitious. It's very big. I mean, you can make bad sculpture, but you make very big bad sculpture. <laughs> so, but someday that ridiculous piece of sculpture will fall. 
it's bound to its gravity and time, right? Hubris is what power never takes into account. They think they're always going to be there. It's going to fall quicker than they think, right? I mean, the only hope that when the three, whatever, 150 meters, it's four times the Statue of Liberty. I don't know what they were thinking. But when it falls, it's going to do a lot of damage. But it will fall, right? So we, we were very interested in these moments of anticipated destruction, that all power and all claims to power ultimately become ruin. So with um, Coronation Park, one can build a little story. And there are, there are about eight moments in this story, and it doesn't take so long, so I'll read it before we end. The king without a face. Begin provisionally at the last square, like a chess game in reverse. The dark pawn is about to be crowned and the pale king is in check. The history of the sovereign gets rubbed off the coin with use. That can also be history. Skip a turn and stand still for now, forever. The viceroy's better half. Sometimes just standing is the best move, especially if it is a last stand. Solitude will have at least a leg, maybe two, to stand on. Fine legs, too. Truncated midsection. At a certain indeterminate approximate stage of the game, it becomes difficult to digest the rules. The players get forgetful. Histories infect each other like stomach bugs. In Delhi, we call it Delhi. Delhi. <laughs> Memory, said St. Augustine, is the stomach of the mind. Then history must be the stomach of power. What happens if that distended belly gets an ulcer? Sometimes the surgeon's knife excises the stomach to get rid of the canker. Left with an empty treasure chest, the story gone bust, you can either draw from the bank or ask for a loan from another player. That's what's happening. You've got the governor of the reserve, ex-governor of the reserve bank coming. I told you, ask him a question. Why does the government of India want to rob its own bank? <laughs> right? Four, the empty rope. The other players change the game. No more monopoly. Now we play strip poker. Time shows its cards and someone has to pay. Except that in this game, nakedness is best seen as emptiness. It's the opposite of the well-known children's story. So um, think of the empty robe, the robe that the emperor has left behind as he has gone walking naked into the street. So this is what we call the emperor's old clothes. The emperor had only his clothes, there was nothing to the rest of him. That was all. The grip. In the matter of letting go, which is the very opposite of getting a grip, one has to obey every relevant thermodynamic principle. In the end, Every substance, even constituted power, dissolves into wild energy. Learning to be a good loser is as difficult as learning how to win. Abdication is as tough a game as coronation. Boots. Try and play the adversary's hand. Step out of your boots and not his shoes. Sometimes the fit is remarkable. You can play against yourself just as easily as you would for yourself. The highest goal of the self is usually a self-goal. The bending man. Defeat comes hard-coded with the victor's stance. The winner bends to receive the medal. The empty plinth. So the last one was just a plinth with no statue. Back to square one, no winners, nothing to lose. Nothing but the future remains of the past. An empty garden, a vacant game, awaiting play. Your turn. Now, each of these sculptures was annotated by a little bit of text, which is not what I just read. They were in these circular plaques. And the text was from a remarkable essay by George Orwell, who has become a kind of friend of our work for a long time. Uh, it's called Shooting an Elephant, in which Orwell, as a young police officer in Burma, he was born in Motihari in Bihar, which very few people know, um, and grew up in boarding school in England and went back to try his luck in India. He was a police officer in Burma, and he was asked to shoot an elephant. And he knew at that point of time that if he shot the elephant, he would be hated, 
for shooting a great beast. And if he didn't shoot the elephant and was afraid, he would be reviled for being a coward. So in this essay, he begins his political task of questioning what power actually means. And for me, it's a very salutary thing that Orwell's critique of totalitarianism actually begins with a moment within colonial India. Right? And it's something that is usually forgotten when we discuss Orwell, but I think he remains a salutary example for us all to think about what power is. Subsequently, we made a long piece of work called Provisions for Everybody, which sort of marks his itinerary from Burma to Spain to Britain, looks at coal mining, so it's as obsessive about coal mining as the other one was about iron, and tries to enter a dialogue between the Buddha's Charter of Doubt, in which the Buddha starts asking people to not take what he says for granted and to question everything. And the reason why we do that is because the Buddha's Charter of Doubt is delivered as a sermon in the town where Orwell was born which is one of those strange coincidences that make the life of the Rocks Media Collective possible. I will end with that. Thank you. So the three of us are going to have a start off with a conversation and then we're going to open it up to uh, the public. wordplay around touch that actually emerges in the kind of long array of Rex's work, but especially in the things that you were showing. Of course, touch from Tangier, right, mm -hmm. gives us both tango, yeah. the and dance, and the kind of... Yes, of course, in the Bible, right? This is the, mm -hmm. the moment at which, uh, it's the, the great moment at which Jesus says to Mary Madeline, you know, don't touch don't me. Don't touch me. Let go of me. Um, but, Touch also then gives us tactility, uh, textile, and I wanted to go back to the carpet yes. uh, a little bit. Uh, but also it gives us text. Right. And I've I just been thinking about the ways in which moving and touching actually provide contingency for us. So maybe not coincidence yeah. at the end, but contingency that you're actually constantly finding these moments. That's of, so much nicer. Do, do cite my book, please. <laughs> um, but I, I would like to I'd like to hear you talk about touch about tactility, but also about the question of of affect, um, because of course one of the great Rux works is the the clock. How is that? Is that better? Um, the the Rux clock, which is such an extraordinary piece. Yeah, keep talking. But I I. I would just love to hear you talk a little bit about what the work of touches. So this is the this extraordinary clock that we could also. This is also about touching. Yes, of course, the fingerprint. This is Kanai, uh, right? Yes. But when you know so much of what your work is is also moving between the digital again to touch right digits um, and the analog, I'm just wondering where, what happens to the tactile to be affective to being pierced to being moved. Thank you, Ulumi. I'm touched. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, seriously, I think the I think you completely zeroed in on what it means for, for us to get older. Mm -hmm. And when we began, when we were very young, 
when rocks began to hit, was a much more cerebral practice than it is now. Mm -hmm. It was much more disembodied than it is now. Over the last 27 years, we've had children, we've had illnesses, we've grown old, our bones are getting tired. And we know a lot more about what it means to touch and to be touched by the world. Whether it's the fabric of textiles, so thinking, we did a show in Manchester where we were obsessed with thinking about uh, cotton and how, what it means when it touches the body. We, um, we've been thinking a lot about uh, nerves and nervous systems and how nerves get excited. Um, and I might just, <clears throat> so, sorry, um, that's the clock, by the way, it's a clock, it's a book of hours, um, and it's a map of the world, because there are 27 clocks, each in different long longitudes that describe the world, but let's not get distracted. Um, yeah. These are two source images that I want to talk about. This is from a work called Not Yet at Ease, which we just finished. And these are men who are, most of them are soldiers, some of them are laborers, in Kut in Iraq, Mesopotamia at that time, during the First World War. 6,000 of these men died of hunger in a siege, waiting to be relieved by the British Expeditionary Force, which never came. But they found during this siege, which got worse and worse, this probably early days, they were dancing, right? And there are these moments of intimacy between the soldiers. This is another such moment. It's in a prisoner of war camp in um, Germany at the same time. And these are Indian prison soldiers who are prisoners of war. and who hold a, a tableau, they do a Ramlila, they do a play and they dress up, they, they get into drag, they, they do all sorts of things and they touch each other in a way that you're not supposed to touch yourself in the military or other people. And this work that we made, Not Yet at Ease, which includes this 140 meter wall, which is about nerves, expressions, Langu in language to do with nerves and drawings of nerves from the 1916 period and a labyrinth of padded cells which is what soldiers would have found themselves in when they were sick from what we now recognize as post-traumatic stress disorder but at that time there was a refusal to diagnose this as shell shock mm -hmm. both British and Indian ordinary soldiers we diagnosed under a condition called not yet diagnosed nervous. The reason being shell shock was seen as the man who coined it as being a condition that everybody would understand. And that they would come back by saying, you know, I, I, and one of the symptoms of shell shock is the inability to, of the nerves, the extremities, to, to feel anything when they touch something. In the, in the, in the symptom of it, whatever it is called. The, the classic manual of symptoms of, of shell shock, all of the things. Dislocation of hearing, hearing voices, and patients complaining that they either felt too much or they felt too little. So the nervous system, as, which is the infrastructure of touching action, is something that is increasingly interesting now. And it is like a textile. The nerves are like threads that run through our bodies. And there is, we recently curated an exhibition at the MACPA in Barcelona, where one of the artists we invoked was, when we exhibited as a contemporary artist, was a Spanish neurosurgeon called Ramon y Caja, who made the first drawings of the nervous system. And he found something quite remarkable, that the nerves actually do not touch each other. Nerve endings in our bodies are at a distance. And what travels between them is an electrical impulse. And I'm beginning to think that that electrical impulse, if we think of this room, let's say, as a nervous system, and each one of us as a nervous system, then 
although we are at a distance, we are actually touching each other. Everything we see, and I think now of contemporary artistic practice as an inherently corporeal practice, because until and unless it raises some goosebumps, it's not worth it. So that's my response to you. Um, I, I wanted to maybe give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about the fact that rocks began from a kind of documentary film practice, um, and that's kind of how you had originally met, and the first things you did, and when you just answered, uh, or began by answering Ptolemy by saying, well, initially we did much more cerebral work, um, and we have the experience of being touched by life in the world and others have taken us in this other direction. Because um, I had thought, I just wanted to hear you talk a little bit about that origin in, in, uh, in documentary uh, film practice and television. But then I thought, as I heard your answer, that maybe also to link that with the question of writing, which is also so central to how you as a collective um, engage with the world, but also uh, offer your work to others, right? And there's something about maybe this question of touch um, because that in writing uh, that can be a way of articulating that distance or that move from documentary filmmaking as such as you were practicing it, you know, in uh, 30 years ago, or 27 years ago, and how writing has become much more central. Thank you. Um, I was talking to one of the students here today, Lena, about her, her questions about the difference between framing the, what can be produced as real and what is fictional. How, in the same work, does one mediate between the real, the real and the fictional register. And I, and I was studying her that the big difference in my life has been the transition from documentary, although I didn't say it that way, mm -hmm. to what is called reality TV. <laughs> right. So the real as a trope is a ghost that haunts our practice still today. I mean, now we make lots of things. We make sculpture, we make holograms. The very opposite of documentary material is a hologram, is, a, is an image entirely made out of coat that dissolves and forms itself in, your eye, in front of your eyes. So this, the sculpture with the empty robe that you saw also has a life as a hologram, which is very ghostly because it's the robe that appears. But um, that said, I think the other thing that I told me now is that the only thing that documentary filmmaking school, when Chidesh Monica and I went to a very small, nondescript film school in Delhi. It has now become something else. But at that time, it was such an inconsequential school that they used to give us 300 rupees a month just to study there. <laughs> Everybody was encouraged to study. Right? Um, so, because the, nobody wanted to do this kind of thing. And it was a poor school, a frugal school, in which nothing much happened. But we taught each other a lot of things. That laid the foundation of two things this constant autodidacticism in conversation, trying to it. And a certain attitude towards the world, which, as I was telling Irina, consisted mainly of waiting for things to happen. The documentarist does not have the privilege that artists otherwise have, which is that they can snatch inspiration from the air. In documentary filmmaking school, you wait. Most of the time, nothing happens. Right? That's what being a documentary filmmaker is about. You stand at street corners, nothing happens. It's when you get really bored. It's what all, it's what also distinguishes. It, it's it's why documentary filmmakers are such good friends with anthropologists. 
<laughs> nothing happens most of the time. Nothing happens. Historians, you spend so much time in the archive waiting for one little thing, and you read reams and reams of material. Nothing happens. It's when you get really bored that the magic begins. And for me, and for our conversation in rocks, it's that being pickled in the archive, being being constantly sort of almost falling asleep all the time. <laughs> that, that produces the, the length of time necessary for something to happen. In the, let's say, in this work about the First World War, this work required at least two years of work in different archives, in the India Office Library, in the Sound Archive, in the Alexander Humboldt Museum in Berlin, in the Humboldt University in Berlin, in the Imperial War Museum, going through masses of photographs, sound recordings. There are 360 sound recordings of Indian soldiers in Berlin from 1916 as wax cylinder recordings. So they are whispers on a wall. There are these amazing testimonies of, of these men producing songs, literature, <coughs> poetry, you know, doing everything that Walter Benjamin said soldiers don't do in wartime. Now, going through all that is really tedious work, but it is the documentary formation that enabled us to do that. Now to come to the second part of your question. This also meant a practice of note-taking. So, because we are three people, we forget things. I constantly forget what Jubesh told me or what Monica told me. So we have to annotate each other all the time. So that the, the diagram of the software that is the snapshot of our conversation is an index of that fact. So the literariness of the practice, or whatever it's worth, actually comes from the necessity to remind each other what we said the other day. It's constantly writing to each other, both through email and now annoyingly through WhatsApp. So I wake up in the morning here, the time zone's away, but I have to literally, with my fingers, touch what my colleagues are saying. And that constant conversation produces its own fermentation, which then leads to the writing. And the writing is never ultimately about the work. It is its own thing, because it is constructed out of the memory of these conversations that have their own logic in it. Is that? Yeah. Will you talk a little bit about the carpet? Mm -hmm. the, the one that is, am I right, that it's actual, it, it was done by, by artisans in... Bulgaria. Uh, Bulgaria. Um, but it is a representation of your internet yes. interactions bet between the three of you. It's a map drawn from that diagram that I showed. Um, so we were thinking to each other, what do we actually sit on? And then we said we sit on, the, on, on whatever happens, the traffic that's between us. So that's what we sit on. What is the thing that you sit on? You sit on a carpet. So is there a carpet of conversations? Is there a house of conversations? There is another work which is called The House of Everything and Nothing, where an entire house is clad with the lines of that, like the carpet. So the carpet becomes a house. And inside it, you live. So we live inside the house of everything and nothing, which is our conversation. That particular carpet was the first carpet. Now we make lots of carpets, because carpets, you know, like how do you run an artistic practice? Sell carpets. carpets. <laughs> so there, there's been a carpet called Base, there's been another carpet that's come out of a performance work called The Necessity of Infinity, which is an imagined conversation between Ibn Sina and Al-Biruni, two, two 11th century polymaths who talk about everything from the gender of God to whether there's life in other planets and so on. It's really wild. Now, to do that, we have to sit on a carpet. So we have to make a carpet. And that carpet gets made. That's another carpet. We're now making 10 other carpets, which are out of figures, pixelated figures in public demonstrations. So carpets have a way of 
because they're really crazy things. I mean, they're the interesting. We, we saw lots of mobile miniatures yesterday, and if you look at a mobile miniature, you realize the framing devices of mobile miniatures look like carpets. They're little carpets, and this something to sit on, which provides you with the with the impression that you're in a garden. Because a carpet is a woven garden. That's what it is, right? And the, let's say when the Mughals came to India, they didn't think they were Babur, the first Mughal emperor, hated Delhi. They said, this is such an ugly country. There are no gardens here. So the only thing they could do was to bring carpets to sit on. And of course, carpets are flying machines, because they're flying carpets, right? So carpets do all that kind of work that is necessary for them to do for us. Um, I maybe I'll ask this one question and then we'll, we'll open it up so that people get a chance. Um, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the question of um, familiarity and the untranslatability, right? Because all your work and your practice is you know, coming from this idea that no unit in and of itself is singular, right? That everything is always somehow multiple and carries with it either both or both its ghosts and how you began like those millions of other things that are inside of every unit or every body in this case, right? So that we are, each unit is always kind of almost infinite multiplicity. Um, but then you, when you talk about, or you insist in a way in untranslatability, or in leaving things untranslated, right? Because one cannot be familiar. That familiarity is what has bred, at the end of the day, the, the, the fakeness of familiarity is what has bred so many problems, <laughs> a political problems, social problems. Um, but there seems to be a tension there, because you know that there's, that there's a way in which there, your practice and your world view is thinking of the kind of coexistence of multiplicities in one, like your collective, you are three in one, right. you are here as them. Um, so in a way, it, you know, so there's a way in which a translation and a, is always happening or, or, or in that proximity, and yet at the same time, the kind of political stance of saying like, no, things must remain untranslatable. There has to be a, a, a distance, right? So I think, yeah. so I, I don't know if that no, question makes no, I, sense. No, it totally makes sense. It is the thing that makes sense when three people work together for 27 years. Mm -hmm. Because there are two things that happen. Of course, I am not Jivesh, I am not Monica, they are not so in every given moment of time, we do what all children do with each other, which, with parents. We tell each other lies, which is important because unless you tell each other lies, you can never have a theory of the mind of the other person. Mm -hmm. There's a beautiful early Platonic dialogue where Phidias, I think, where, where, Plato, where, where he constructs the figure of the liar as the only truth speaker. Because the liar needs to know what is true in order to speak. The point that I'm making is that, first of all, we do not know the contents of the mind of the other person. We never can. And the contents of the mind of the other person are also changing. Not only do we not know it now, they also do not know it, because the contents of their mind are changing. So there are, who is it, Donald Rumsfeld, two unknown, <laughs> unknown unknowns, right? So the, these constantly evolving conditions of unknowability mm -hmm. is what is the precondition of living with other people. Mm -hmm. If we were to declare that we cannot know other people as much as we would like to, we can know some things, but that unknowing other people is not necessarily, not necessarily the reason for cutting their heads off. That's the tension between understanding and untranslatable. And in a practice that is so contingent on its words, 
We are also aware of the fact that there are things that we are thinking for which we do not have words at the moment. That happens all the time. The, currently, we are trying to develop a work in which we are hoping to persuade a school somewhere, kindergarten, to, to develop a syllabus of learning to speak the language of dolphins. Because there are these marine biologists and computer programmers who have claimed that they're trying to develop a vocabulary for, for first dolphin language, and now they've started talking about pigs. So if one were to treat children in kindergarten as saying that you, know, you will learn how to talk to dolphins, just like you would learn how to talk in English or other, other languages. What does that do? So could we be the catalysts of the first experiment in human-animal communication, which we know nothing about? Right? Now, this requires, but it's, it's possible. I mean, these are people who claiming that they'll do this. The reason why they're doing this is because they have, as with everything, military capital. The reason why, including this country, is really investing a lot of money in trying to understand how whales and dolphins communicate is because they can disguise submarines talking to each other in these languages. And if they, they're done in the same way as MRIs are done, through magnetic resources. Dolphins do two things. They squeak and they echolocate like bats. They send signals that create kind of a strange imagery in their mind that they don't see, but they know. Now, if we were to try and produce this as a, as a language form, we would, as Rocks Media Collective, begin the process of communicating in languages that no one has ever done. The children lie. So, we, <laughs> so this means that in a sense, not knowing what somebody is going to say is actually not the end but the beginning of communication. That's the translator's silence. Um, I want to invite I want to invite anyone who has questions. There's a microphone over here. Um, Mm -hmm. If you raise your hand, the microphone can come to you. Thank you so much for sharing and gracing us with your presence. Um, both tonight and yesterday you spoke about um, planetary encounter. And you said so, it seems like you are relating it specifically in the context of time. That this planetary encounter is an encounter also in time, and I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that. Well, very briefly, it is an, it is, uh, an awareness that the planet is an entity that changes in time. If it's been around for four and a half billion years, it's changed over the four and a half billion years. Tectonic plates have shifted. India used to be the neighbor of Antarctica before it became what it is from tectonic drift. And that's not a process that has ended. So we might end up somehow next to Los Angeles sometime. In a few million years, that might happen. So it's to understand that the things we take for granted as solid and stable and eternal are in fact contingent. Especially in landscapes. Other questions? Uh, Alan has a question for you. If, if I remember, if I remember correctly, I think, um, or I remember it this way at least, uh, you're saying that you record your conversations, in, in, after your conversations uh, with each other, um, each of you then records a conversation. So I was interested in the relationship between memory 
uh, and so recalling with communication and translation um, and it's strong to remember because it's always reading and um, and that in itself being a translation and I guess that becomes if each of you are translating the same conversation you end up with three different yeah, of course. Documents which might not match at all. Um, so I was interested more about blackboard yeah. memory. But uh, the other thing I was thinking about was um, in relation to empathy, um, not that I'm necessarily advocating for it, um, but uh, it's wrong in imagining um, the mind of the other or the, 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 the stranger. Mm. Well, we do end up with three completely different documents all the time, every day. Um, because the annotation, the writing practice is both a point of recall of what we might have said to each other, and also a point of anticipation of what we might want to say to each other the next day. So there's a fleeting thought. Uh, for instance, this morning I sent a WhatsApp to um, Monica saying, we've done a lot of clocks. We're now making a clock for, the, for the 36 words for love. In, in, in Urdu, in a clock, and it moves around. So I said, we've done lots of clocks, why don't we start making globes now? Um, as you know, the clocks are devices for measuring time, let's think about a, a device that expresses space. That's Torah. And, and if that is possible to do, so that's an annotation. That's not, that's not a recalling of the thought, I'm doing that now, but that's something we will talk about when we meet in a week's time. So sometimes the note fails the memory, or exceeds it, or is at a tangent to it. And then, of course, we misread each other all the time, like all human beings do, which ends up producing three different documents and constant disagreement. But the work of Rux is neither of those three documents. The work of Rux is what happens if you say dialogic or dialectical uh, relationship, is the figure that we have between ourselves called the third man. Right? It's in mountaineering there is always this idea that when you're hallucinating and when you're like when oxygen levels really drop, mountaineers are always encouraged to envision a companion who is always saying, okay, look, you, you just the, the difficulty of mountaineering is you can climb thousands of feet. So if the companion says, forget about how high it is, just take three more steps. Right? This, the third man, uh, figure, who is neither me nor Jibesh nor Monica, we're always talking two at a time, so there's always a third. That's what Rux is. The entity of Rux Media Collective exists as a result of the disagreements misreadings and misunderstandings that are a constant feature of the archive of the practice. It's the ghost. Uh, the other aspect around empathy. Empathy. As, as an imagining of the other. Yeah, I mean, the more, I, the more we try and think about nervous systems, the more, uh, well, nervous systems have this lovely double meaning there. They're systems of nerves, but they're also systems that are nervous. <laughs> or, and I think what excites each other every day, even now, 27 years of this disaster that we are, is, is empathy, is, is the attempt to say, I will stick with you even if I don't understand what you're saying. And that, that is a kind of suspension of one's own will and a willingness to be, I don't, I don't know if it's empathy, but it, a willingness to be with the will of another person and then see where it goes. What is that? And in an artistic practice, it means always being prepared for the unpredictable because you're not relying on your own resources. In fact, you're relying on everything but your own. I had a question about uh, nervous systems and networks. If you think of the self-similarity of our nervous system in our body, and 
perhaps the communities we form and how they interact and then the networks we build. Where do you think that idea breaks down and where does it resonate well? You know, the, the, just the idea that a, a society would be an extended body with the nervous system as well. Well, it's always tricky and risky to think of societies as bodies. Because that means that societies will end and die, like bodies will. Which I don't have a problem considering. I mean, I don't even have a problem considering the death of the human species. But, to think of societies as nervous systems entirely also presumes that societies have a singularity of the will, because every nervous system in us is constituted as a singularity. However, if you are prepared to say, like I am, that we are a coalition of different life forms, you know, the, the bugs, the bacteria in me that are producing hunger are have a different imperative from the bacteria in my other parts of the body that are producing other sensations, and that there's this constant sort of coalition of the unwilling that produces the human personality or the being. That model of thinking of society as a nervous system, I'm willing to accept. I'm also willing to accept it, provided we accept the fact that the nervous systems are not contiguous, they are full of gaps. And what produces communication within the system is the electrical you know, impulses between the synapses. Then we have a model where there are different nodes which are reflecting each other all the time. I mean, that's a bit like the internet, no? I mean, that's, that's that messages and signals pass through each other despite obstruction, so that even if one bit of it dies off, the, the signal system remains. That is one way in which we could consider society and communities as nervous systems. But it's also interesting for me to think about, like, let's assume that each one of us is a nervous system. And at the moment, they are in some kind of weird contact with each other. I mean, right now, we have the willingness to be in contact with each other. But if we were on a bus with 100 other people in a bus, there would still be a form of contact with each other. And moments of panic or terror or joy are instances where you can see what that contact means. Right? Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Dr. Ray here. Um, you, you very wonderfully explained to us how collaboration works. Um, it's serendipitous moments, um, it's openness to chance. Um, yet, a globe is an idea, it's not a work. There's something that goes in between a globe becoming a work, right? And much of your work is driven by the archive. Um, and in many instances, one, when one enters into the archive, there is boredom, yes, but there are certain kinds of voices that one is more attuned to than others. Um, and in some, in most instances, it's those voices that your work draws out. So I'm wondering if you could sketch out for us a little genealogy of racks, if I may put it in those terms. Uh, perhaps Sarai, subaltern studies, um, how does, how did, did rocks happen conceptually? The genealogy of Sarai lies in rocks, not the other way around. Sarai was, a, was something that was produced by rocks and two other individuals, Ravi Vasudevan and Ravi Sundaram. So it's not that rocks came out of Sarai, but uh, yeah. But to answer your question, is there a genealogy? I think there is a genealogy in terms of, for instance, the formation within documentary filmmaking. Not in a particular school, but in the expanded practice of what documentary and essay filmmaking in the 1990s was. Not what it is today. There was a certain genealogy, I think, in the in Anyone who's familiar with Delhi at that time will be familiar with the intensity of arguments and conversations that had a philosophical, political edge 
without any practical purpose in mind. We, over the last 30 years, one of the things that I had become a little disenchanted about is that in Delhi when I was growing up, we talked about things without necessarily thinking that it's going to end up being any use to anyone. Now there is a professionalization of conversation. When we were in film school, we would talk endlessly and listen to each other, and listening was a practice of endurance. And there was an element of shared reading. This comes from scarcity. In a city like Delhi, libraries were few, books were unavailable, intellectuals were difficult and often condescending. <laughs> so, being 20 something and you wanted to think about the world, you were left very much to your own resources. And I remember that. There was an ethic, for instance, of sharing photocopies of books because you couldn't afford them or they were not there in the library. Now that business of sharing ideas is more or less a hand-to-hand -hand or hand-to-mouth basis was formative for us. And it had, I mean, subsequently many of the figures who populate the the pantheon of subaltern studies became people we grew to be intimate and friends with. But we would re read them first as photocopies and then know them as human beings. And that movement from the loving piracy of knowledge to the acknowledgement of a sociality of information, of, 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 of intimacy, of a public intimacy with them, is part of the genealogy. Of I don't know if that partially answers you. I really appreciated uh, the time you spent talking about Coronation Park. And it just had me thinking, of course, of the debates around uh, taking down monuments and statues of Confederate figures in the South. And it just made me think more broadly about Rock's practice as wildly generative, always making new, bringing things together, producing in new ways. And I'm wondering if there are times that you could talk about destruction actually perhaps being a part of your practice or your way of thinking. Um, of course, there's a kind of uh, production in something new and say what the ghost can, can offer, mm -hmm. but, but I'm just trying to think about um, think, think about Coronation Park and, and the question of what to do with these southern monuments. Well, I think they have to be left to ruin. You know, I mean, they will fall. They, there is, I mean, I have a slightly tangential relationship to these claims to make things fall, right? which satisfies the needs of those who want things to fall, which is fine. If there is a statue of a confederate leader in your university then, and you want it to fall, then that is something that satisfies you, it gives you pleasure. But it will fall. Right? And I think it's quite interesting to think about the fact that, I mean, I, why just, why make it fall? Why not cut off its head? Because then it stays there as a reminder of its own fragility. I mean, I have had many differences over the years with the um, tendencies that designate themselves as the ultra-left in India. But there is one point in which I'm in complete agreement with them, which they are now embarrassed about. The Noxalite movement in Calcutta cut off the heads of national leaders on statues. I think that's the best thing that ever happened in Indian cultural life. It didn't, it didn't, it just decapitated them. And I have great sympathy for uh, decapitation of statues. <laughs> you, you don't have to, you know, they, they can stay there. And 
and if you notice, Coronation Park is actually full of decapitated icons. But you also make things that, when touched, degrade. Um, for example, the, the translator of silence, we have a copy of it, and every time yeah. it, you touch it, because it's, you know, it's cut paper, it is constantly yeah, yeah. ripping, and it is, I understand that this is the point, but it is a maddening yeah. encounter with your work. That this thing that you want to be touched, laid, you want it to be touched, touched. Right? It needs to be touched in yeah. order to be, yeah. is always failing because of your touch. Yeah. But that's fine. <laughs> Things should, you know, be rolled to end, that's fine. I mean, there's, I spend a lot of time in museums, and we often end up talking, we, our favorite people are conservationists and work on things last long, and they know that they're, it's a failing game. It will, you know, and like, as I once spoke to a museum conservator, and I said, so what is your biggest enemy? And she said to me, light. <laughs> <laughs> because with, let's say, uh, materials in, in uh, oils and so on, or lots of pigments, their, their adversary is light. The function of the museum is to bring them out into the light, and the conservator wants to darken the museum. This is this is a day, this is the daily life of museums. So, in, in given that objects last in distressed condition and change their form, they change, right? So, I am quite happy with the fact that the work by Rux degrades. There is a secret behind contemporary art exhibition that many people don't know is that when a work does not get acquired and if it is large you have to destroy it so we are constantly writing to museums send us the picture of its destruction because it has that that's proof that it no longer exists that's a condition of the of the life of objects in the world. I think what I'm is it. I mean, you can get another one. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, you've addressed this in various ways uh, throughout the uh, discussion today, but I was wondering if you could speak more directly about authorship um, and, and how um, you know, in, in your um, in your thinking about the the third, um, I forget the third, how you describe the third person. It. Third the one. third person, yeah, uh, within within sort of that formulation, but also in this way that you guys um, are constantly in conversation with other authors and and uh, makers and um, other um, other readers. Um, how how are you thinking about authorship? Okay, two things. There is sometimes a confusion made about us as if we are an instance of collaboration. We are not. I am not collaborating with Jibesh or Monica. They are not collaborating with me. Rux collaborates with architects, with historians, with programmers, and so on. What happens between the three of us is not a collaboration. The instance of the emergence of the third man is not where we, in each instance, say, okay, let's unite our forces and make something happen. The author is the moment of that instance. And so all our work is authored by rocks at all times. So I operate in the world as an individual who is, in some ways, an agent sometimes a secret agent of this author. So I give the author an agency that the author gives to me. So that, and so do our, so do my two comrades. To go back to the question of genealogy, in our very formative years, we were very influenced by the notion of creation in a commons. In digital commons in, initially. 
and Sarai, the space that we co-founded with others, was very invested in the ideas of copyleft or free software or free and open source software, all of these are different things. But we were very invested in the idea that authorship could be networked entities, which were flexible, which were fluid, not necessarily bounded in the legal fiction of a person. So that's also a part of the genealogy. And we, one of the tech, an early text we wrote was a text called the Lexicon of the Digital Commons, which incidentally, to my great delight, has been embroidered by an, an anonymous group of about 70 people across the world. And it exists as a work of the fine and noble art of embroidery, which we discovered after the fact. Three years after it was done, somebody told us this has been done. Because that text pays a lot of attention to weaving, stitching, the fabric arts. So that's how we see authorship. And to see authorship as a function of a moment or a time, rather than being bounded within bodies. There is a moment that is the author of a work. And that moment, the continuity of that moment is Rock's Media Collective. I don't know if... Yeah. I wanted maybe to ask a last question, and it's um, maybe... I, we're we're going to break rocks right now. Okay, break, 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 break the wall. And you're here. And um, what do you feel are your deepest passions that have perhaps moved a lot of your voice into that collective? I know that it might, it might be a kind of difficult, and I'm saying this yesterday, we, there were two topics that came up a lot in our post-seminar conversation. That's all I'm going to say, but they might not be that. But I'm just saying, it just made me think, you know, like what you, you, as this individual who belongs to a collective whose work emerges at specific moments of a very complex network um, set of encounters, uh, what do you feel is what you, uh, what, what remains in a way your, your, your yeah. I have so many passions. Oh, okay. Um, dictionaries. <laughs> I love dictionaries. Because I think of them as gigantic and beautiful machines that can produce everything. Love letters, recipes, books. Um, the first thing I did when I came here in Berkeley was to get myself a dictionary. There is a very, I mean, the, the dictionary that I love the most is the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language. It's an amazing dictionary because it gives you entirely provisional and contingent and made up in some ways etymologies based on a fictional idea of proto-Indo-European. There's a man, crazy man called Albert Watkins who gives like of every English word like these little bits of like the word, the sound fragment ad or j. And they're made up, most of them are made up, but they're a work of art. So I stay up nights reading dictionaries. I used to read telephone directories. <laughs> Argentina, Buenos Aires is a great stuff. <laughs> um, I like looking at rocks, at waves, at listening, at overhearing things. Uh, because we travel so much, I'm like a magnet for crazy people to tell me stories in airports, bus stations, and I really enjoy that. Sometimes to the great annoyance of my colleagues. Um, so, if you think of what drives me, it's an effort which recognizes its own failure of trying to read and understand things. Not as a way to master them, but as a way to be in love with them. 